Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to talk to you today about long COVID, also known as post-acute COVID-19 syndrome. Here are my disclosures and here are the objectives for this presentation. So this condition or cluster of conditions has several names listed on the top here, long COVID and or long hauler were actually names that were developed by patients experiencing it. And on the right, you can see uh, the leader of the patient led research collaborative. And so this is one of the few conditions in medicine, I think that was named and described by patients suffering from it as opposed to physicians treating it. Anyway, the CDC calls it post-COVID conditions and the NIH have called it post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection or PASC. There's been very much written about it in the lay press and quite a lot in the medical press too. But in terms of actual science, uh, the case definition I would say is still emerging. We have a more or less agreed upon one, but um, uh, different groups use different ones. True incidence of, the, of this condition is still not well established. And the problem is that of the very many published cohort studies that are out there, most of them lack a rigorous control group of people that don't have signs and symptoms. So for example, the, the ones without don't come for follow-up, they don't respond to um, requests for telephone interviews and so forth. But the reports we do have include uh, patients from all ages, including children, all stages of disease, people that were previously in excellent health, pregnant people and so forth. The risk factors for developing this and the pathophysiology are both under investigation and management strategy, strategies in evolution with no specific sort of magic medicine identified to date. And so this graphic I think is helpful in terms of looking at the chronology of it. So you can see in the purple line, viral respiration, uh, isolation from the respiratory tract and the green line nasopharyngeal. And for most people, both of these will resolve completely after about four weeks, but in some there'll be a subacute or ongoing condition and then um, going out to chronic post COVID conditions uh, many of the symptoms listed there on the right. For some people, this persists for months. We now have it um, reports of people with persistent symptoms for more than a year now that it's been going on that long. So these are the definitions. This is the CDC, US CDC definition listed here. The NIH, which um, has a research definition, it's not really in the business of naming conditions. And then, as I mentioned, patients calling it long COVID or long Waller syndrome. The proposed pathophysiology is multifactorial at this point. Uh, there may be some contribution from virus specific changes. For example, patients with prolonged viremia, perhaps even reservoirs, immunological aberrations, as we all know, particularly in some, uh, moderate to severe COVID are common. There may be inflammatory damage following this, for example, by mast cell activation. Obviously, those that have been very ill will have sequelae of just a chronic illness, potentially from a secondary bacterial or fungal infection and or uh, cardiovascular deconditioning. And so there is obviously overlap with the post-ICU syndrome that we're familiar with, and also PTSD, which can cause prolonged symptoms in affected patients. And so I think like many things in medicine, a single unifying hypothesis or mechanism for this condition is unlikely and it probably will be multifactorial. So in terms of incidents, as I said, there's been many reported cases. I think this one is uh, perhaps um, one of the more useful ones. It's relatively recent. It comes from the UK, where, as you know, they have a nationalized health system. So they were able to look in electronic health records of very many patients, more than 270,000, who had confirmed COVID and then look for these uh, associated diagnoses in their health records either up to 90 days or up to 180 days post or both. And you can see that overall 
the estimate is about a third, perhaps a bit more of patients had at least one symptom three to six months after infection. And I think this is probably about in the right ballpark for incidence of this condition. And so, um, as I mentioned, all studies are confounded by the lack of a control group, but there has been a recent report of Ita from an Italian cohort of patients with symptoms uh, at one year of follow-up. So it's, it's really quite chronic in some. So it, uh, I think it's important to remember that here in the US, we have currently reported more than 39 million COVID cases. And so even if the prevalence or incidence of this condition is only 10%, this is almost 4 million people. So this is a lot of people that are going to require follow-up care and management of their post-COVID conditions, which can range literally from head to toe. There is a thing called COVID toe, which is thought to be some kind of vasculitis and multiple uh, cerebral um, complications. So I'm going to focus on just a few here because obviously we can't cover all of it in the time allowed, but some of the more concerning conditions, uh, cardiac conditions are reported relatively commonly and the manifestations in the heart are myocarditis, arrhythmias, uh, cardiomyopathy, again, pathogenesis, uh, multiple purported um, mechanisms that may be occurring and some concern of uh, perhaps increase in chronic heart failure as a result of this. So some of the representative studies, this is a German study of 100 patients who underwent cardiac MRI imaging and were found to have cardiac involvement in a high proportion of patients, particularly those with comorbidities. But remember, this is, of course, a non-random sample. This is patients that were referred to a cardiology clinic and so obviously likely biased towards cardiac findings, but definitely real. There have been some autopsy studies which are illuminating where uh, SARS-CoV involvement in the heart was documented in about two thirds of patients with a viral load above a thousand copies uh, in 41% and the cytokine response panel of some pro-inflammatory genes that may be contributing. So some interesting pathophysiologic research going on here in the cardiovascular space. This study got a lot of attention because it includes previously healthy, in fact, extremely healthy athletes who had uh, COVID-19 infection and subsequent cardiac involvement. And so the, these were uh, 26 competitive college athletes. None actually hospitalized. They weren't that sick. Most didn't have symptoms, but uh, almost half of them had evidence of myocardial injury. And so uh, this is definitely a real issue. One of the other cardiovascular, cardiovascular complications, which I think is particularly debilitating, is a POTS-like syndrome of dysautonomia, which is very troublesome for the people that have it with um, terrible dizziness and uh, orthostatic tachycardia. Uh, for now, the recommendations for diagnosis and management are with any other patient with autostatic hypertension, but this is a very unpleasant condition to have. So what about pulmonary conditions in the lungs, uh, the site of the, you know, the primary site for COVID-19 infection? Uh, obviously, chronic cough in some patients, they've developed fibrotic lung disease, bronchiectasis, and even vascular disease. And so will we be seeing an increase in patients with COPD and or pulmonary fibrosis as a result of their COVID-19 infection. And so uh, this is a, a study from China looking at uh, patients who underwent pulmonary function testing uh, up to three months following COVID infection and finding quite high levels of um, decreased pulmonary function and increased radiographic evidence of interstitial thickening and fibrosis in, uh, pati in patients that had been sick with COVID-19. Should people with persistent infiltrates, for example, get treated with steroids? This is a question that's going to come up. Uh, there's a small study 
of patients that may have reported some improvement in symptoms and pulmonary function for this, but significant variability in clinical practice and then no clear consensus about whether steroids should be used, although I'm almost certain that they will be. So what about um, cognitive and uh, neurologic complications? Anosmia, as we know, is an almost pathognomonic sign now of COVID-19 infection. Headaches and dizziness are common in the long COVID conditions and the so-called brain fog, which is trouble, mostly manifest by trouble concentrating and confusion. There have been patients who've had an outright stroke following their infection. Again, multiple mechanisms for pathogenesis, and we still don't know whether this so-called COVID brain is going to be a persistent complication that will um, occur in a in a um, group of patients as yet to be sort of identified. In terms of emotional and uh, well-being, there have been uh, reports of increased anxiety, insomnia, even dementia and mood disorders, as well as general psychiatric disorders after COVID-19 infection. This is a English study showing the different incidence of um, post-influenza and then post-COVID psychiatric illness, mood disorder and anxiety disorder. Again, a study without a real accurate control group other than the influenza ones, which is not quite the same as a normal population, but also helpful. And so I think some of our non-pharmacologic interventions in terms of social distancing and mask wearing either adds to feelings of isolation and loneliness in some people, particularly those that are affected. We're now having an emergence of COVID-related stigma, which uh, can result in a sense of hopelessness and isolation for affected people. And uh, there's some indication that people recovering from COVID can be at in greater risk of depression, anxiety, PTSD, and even substance use disorders, particularly if these were pre-existing. And so in terms of overall management, there's no proven management strategy to date. If you look in clinicaltrials.gov for uh, clinical trials on long COVID, you'll find more than 660 studies of which about half are interventional. A lot of them are various kind of rehabilitation strategies, but there's a lot with what I would consider slightly random um, agents of, of different kind of cytokine agonists, you know, hyperbaric oxygen, sort of every, uh, all kinds of things being tested for this vitamin supplements. Nothing proven yet, but I'm anticipating there'll be uh, more to come before we find something that's really useful. In terms of uh, what kind of exercise should post-COVID patients receive, there's some concerns about the usual aerobic exercise may worsen myocarditis. So this is a helpful review in the BMJ about uh, how to actually advise patients about getting back into an exercise regime that might be beneficial for them to return to their normal health. And then some intriguing but largely anecdotal evidence that a vaccine might actually help with people with long COVID, and this is being studied by a group at Yale, but as I say, as yet, uh, generally anecdotal, but of course, biologically plausible, particularly in the unvaccinated. So uh, this is a, a announcement from my institution, and I think many of you listening have probably seen something similar from the local hospital where you work, where a multidisciplinary post-COVID clinic has been launched to help uh, take care of patients with this condition. And in the US, we have this helpful interactive map where you can click on your state and actually find a post-COVID clinic close to you. And so they follow the usual multidisciplinary approach. And there uh, is some, I think, generally common sense guidance from the CDC. Here's an example of the kind of basic laboratory testing panel that they recommend, which is probably about what most of us would think of doing it all anyway. And so most of the advice is fairly general and non-specific, but I still think helpful. And in terms of the research front, the US NIH and other funding agencies, this is just an example, are investing a lot of money into long COVID and uh, they have um, 
funded now several centers for what they called their Recover Initiative. This was called the PASC Initiative first, but now they're calling it Recover, which is researching COVID to enhance recovery with uh, multiple sites looking at uh, different kinds of research and the kind of long-term uh, well-controlled population studies that we need to get a better idea of incidence and risk factors and of course therapeutic uh, interventions. And so in summary, I think we can anticipate large numbers of patients experiencing this and that this multidisciplinary care approach will be the most useful. I also think it's very important, particularly in the US here, that we ensure access for underserved populations, many of whom were um, uh, hard hit by the COVID pandemic and don't necessarily have access to primary care. And so they're going to need support, including case management and even just support for housing and food. I think it's important for us as providers to listen to our patients. A lot of the initially, initially long COVID sufferers felt they were dismissed for their providers and thought that they you know, felt that they were behaving in a neurotic way that wasn't real. And this is definitely a real issue and that rigorous pathophysiologic observational and interventional trials are still required and we hope will be forthcoming in the months to years to date. And with that, I would like to thank the organizers and look forward to taking questions later.